please welcome to the stage Ash, Director of Conference and Events, Angela Hoffman Cooper, and incoming Ash Council on International Higher Education, Dr. Christina Yao. Hello and good morning. My name is Angela Hoffman Cooper, and I use pronouns she and her. I'm a white woman wearing glasses, an orange blazer, my favorite pair of wildcat shoes. I think I saw a shoe twin out there the other day. Feeling a little sassy today in my wildcat print. And I'm wearing a black dress. It's a pleasure to be here and share space with the Ash community today, both in person and virtually, as we continue our conference journey, learning, sharing, and reflecting how we each individually, collectively, and systemically have responsibility for humanizing higher education. With this in mind, I continue to reflect how the land we are gathered on and streaming from to our virtual attendees is the sacred ancestral land of the New Wu, the Washishu, the New Mu, the Hualape, the New Way, and the Kemhueve people. As we engage today, may we continue to consider how we will gather in community with one another, the lands, and its stewards. Sorry, I have to lower this a little bit. I'm a little bit shorter. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Christina Yao, and I use she, her pronouns. I am an Asian American woman of Chinese descent wearing a t-shirt that has a quotation by Canadian actress Sandra Oh saying it's an honor just to be Asian because it is an honor just to be Asian. So um, I'm a, f thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, applause. Um, I'm a faculty member at the University of South Carolina, which is on the ancestral lands of the Congaree people. Thrilled to be here with everyone and honored for this opportunity to introduce our keynote today. I also want to say a special thank you to two groups who helped bring Dr. Gilborn to us today. The sponsors for this morning's keynote conversation are the Wisconsin Equity and Inclusion Laboratory, better known as the WeLab, and the Organizational Disparities Lab, each of which have benefited tremendously from today's conversation moderator, Dr. Gerlando Jackson. Speaking of, Dr. Gerlando Jackson is the Dean of Michigan State University College of Education and the MSU Foundation Professor of Education. Dean Jackson is of course no stranger to Ash, having served as the editor of the Ash Reader Series and having received the 2018 Council on Ethnic Participation Mildred Garcia Award for exceptional scholarship. With his focus on organizational disparities and commitment to broadening participation for underrepresented groups, Dr. Jackson brings an important perspective as the moderator of today's keynote conversation. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Gerlando Jackson. Our featured keynote for today is Dr. David Gilborn. Dr. Gilborn is Emeritus Professor of Critical Race Studies and Founding Director of the Center for Research in Race and Education at the University of Birmingham, UK. Dr. Gilborn is best known for his research on racism in educational policy and practice, and in particular, for championing the growth of critical race theory internationally. His work has been very influential in my own thinking about race, especially from a global perspective, and I'm sure many in the audience would agree. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. David Gilborn. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for getting up early and joining us. As we start, I just want to put a context in here uh, to Dr. Gilborn. As a reminder, on a personal note, um, we were brought together um, in 2013 by Dr. Nicola Rollick. Uh, I delivered the keynote address for the annual Black History Month conference at the University of Birmingham that was hosted by his center, the Center for Research in Race and Education. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, Black History Month in the UK is in the month of October. Yes, yes, so, so 
Now we get a chance to chat here uh, in, in the U.S. and I want to just welcome him again for joining us, coming all this way for this conversation. I'm going to start with a question if you're ready. Okay. As I'm sure you are aware, your area of expertise, critical race theory, has become rather polarized in the United States. According to Education Week, 42 states in the U.S. have introduced bills or taken other steps to restrict teaching critical race theory or limit how teachers can discuss racism since January 2021. Could you please start by defining critical race theory and share a brief history of its origins? Thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, first of all, to say thank you to Jolando for, for, for doing this and to, to you all for coming along. Uh, 8 a.m. on a Friday morning is um, cruel and unusual punishment, so thank you. Um, in, in terms of uh, critical race theory, um, I mean, it, it, as, as many people in the room know, it, it started in the, the 80s, and it's, a, it's always been um, a, a subversive academic movement. It started in US law schools, particularly in, in law conferences, where um, people of color would stand up and try and name racism uh, and put racism inside the debate, and they would be told that they were being too crude, that um, it was a lot more complicated than that, uh, and they were basically um, told to go elsewhere. So they used to meet in hotel rooms, they then started having uh, their own dedicated meetings. Um, so it's always been fighting against that, um, that desire, not just from the right, but also from elements of the left that want to silence critical analysis of racism uh, and the involvement of, of the academy within that, and in particular, a lot of white academics like myself who feel that they're on the right side, they're progressive, but don't want to deal with racism they're much more comfortable talking about class. Um, so for example, a lot of the early academic critiques of CRT were from um, Marxist uh, educators in, in the UK. Until Trump went after CRT, the only people attacking CRT in the UK were, were white Marxists. Um, and then it got a bit weird because the, the media said, but CRT is Marxist. Um, so that, that, was, that was a clue to, you know, part of the debate is not actually about the reality. But I always think that the best way of explaining to folks CRT is to go back to the beginning. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw, one of the, the key founders of CRT, has written about um, when, when they were putting together the very first meeting and she was playing around with ideas on a pad, writing down uh, words that would kind of summarize what they were trying to do. Uh, and she said, critical because they wanted to get beneath the surface. They wanted the deep structures of, of power and oppression. Race because they were unapologetic in saying we are about racism, focusing on racism, opposing racism. And theory because this is just as theoretical, just as academic as your post-structuralism, as your Marxism. Because within the academy, a lot of the attacks were, well, you know, you're being very crude whenever you talk about race, it's much more complex than that. So I, I always think that, you know, Crenshaw is, is one of the giants of, of academic scholarship. And, and that explanation of why critical race theory, I think is, is, is a great way of encapsulating the approach. You can then spend the next 10 years reading around all the detail of, of what CRT does. It's, it's hugely misrepresented at the moment. I always think, one of the key things about CRT is that it focuses on racism, not just the crude, obvious, in-your-face kinds of racism, but the racism in what, what uh, Richard Delgado calls business as usual. You know, we've always done it like this. A lot of white folks will look at an institution and they don't see racism. They just see a university or they just see a high school or they just see a law practice. Um, but actually, the racism is written through the day-to-day, minute-to-minute realities. So in a classroom, how does a teacher 
decide which student's name is going to be called out for being disruptive? How does a teacher look at somebody and think, oh yeah, they're taking notice, they're listening hard, they're looking up, they're listening, whereas that kid is looking up and thinking about what sports they're playing. Mm -hmm. And all of this stuff is racialized. So I always think that's, 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 that's really what sets good CRT apart. It, it focuses on how racism is part of the fabric of society. It's not a specialist thing that happens occasionally when there's a bad apple. Racism is one of the foundational things upon which education, the economy, policing, everything is built. So you, you shared how legal scholars founded this movement. Can you walk us in any way into understanding for those who haven't watched carefully, how did we start utilizing it in education? Right, well, um, so Gloria Ladson Billings and William Tate were the first people to write about CRT, taking it from, from legal studies and putting it into education. Um, and I've been lucky enough to work with um, Gloria a, a lot, particularly putting together edited collections. Um, and she's written with such clarity about the way that when they started using CRT ideas, the concepts within CRT, Many of these concepts, I think, work just as well for things like gender, sexuality, social class. They're not just limited to race. But once they started using CRT, even within um, a, a supportive environment at Wisconsin-Madison, colleagues would kind of take them on one side and say, this is too dangerous. You need to think carefully. And then when they made the first presentation at AERA, um, there was immediate pushback. Um, it's too crude. Um, what about all the progress that we've made? I mean, one of the things that you constantly hear whenever you identify racism is, oh yeah, but it's a lot better than it was. Um, and you know, this started right at the beginning and has, has continued. So you, know, you can take um, a piece of academic critique from, from 20, 30 years ago and look at a Fox News broadcast last night and they're still saying, well, they deny all progress. They say that the world's just oppressors and victims. This, this continual terror of, of actually being confronted with just how fundamental racism is and how implicated so many parts of society and so many of us are. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, that characterized the early move into education and still continues. I, I started um, using CRT. I'd, I've always been an anti-racist. In England, anti-racists kind of shy away from trying to theorize racism. There's, there's kind of a view that, well, racism's too complicated to just be encapsulated in a single theory. Um, but when I started to work with critical race theorists in the States, particularly uh, Gloria Ladson Billings, Ed Taylor, um, just the power of the concepts. Um, they not only explained what I already knew, they pushed me to ask questions that I wouldn't have asked. Mm. So, you know, one of the, one of the key things about CRT, uh, many people will have heard this idea of interest convergence, that you, you begin to make progress on anti-racism when it's in the interests of white folks, which sounds counterintuitive. And lots of people misunderstand that to think, well, so we make the business case for anti-racism and whites will get on board. That's not what Derek Bell's talking about. As you know, Derek Bell's talking about, well, it's in the interests of whites to make a deal when things have got to such a stage through protest and mobilization that they could lose the whole thing. So then they'll do a deal. But immediately that there's been that that partial convergence of interests, we go into a period of interest divergence, where whites are told, no, actually, you're suffering. Affirmative action's hurting you, even though, actually, the biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action are white women. Um, and, and so the moment that you get even a, a huge landmark reform, the moment you, you've, you've won that victory, you, you have to look at how is that victory being taken away? How is it being subverted? Because it's written in through the, the DNA of the system. Um, sometimes there's deliberate subversion 
that, that white folks involved don't want the reform to happen. Sometimes it's just part of the, the institution because it's already dominated by the assumptions and interests of white people. They just automatically start to claw it back towards their own interest. So, you know, you, the, the key landmark um, legal case around desegregation in the US, one of the most tangible immediate results of that is the closure of thousands of black schools, the uh, black teachers losing their jobs. So what looks like a massive step forward leads to massive regressive action on the ground. Same in the UK. At one point, because of the racist murder of a black young man and the police's abject failure to prosecute, eventually through a community-based campaign, you had racism across the system laid bare and the government said, right, we're going to we're going to rewrite the laws, it's going to be fantastic. And on paper, we had the most radical race equality legislation on earth. But the moment it came in, it was used to shut down every program that had been designed to recruit people of color into teaching. And the argument was, well, now we've got the Equality Act, we have to mainstream equity. And mainstreaming equity means doing away with all of these projects that have been designed by people of color to advance equity. But all of that regressive stuff was being done in the name of equity. So it's this constant battle um, of trying to push back against the, the, the racism that just saturates the everyday routines of the law and education. So we, we have some in the audience that are they're digesting your career of work. Um, so let's take one step back. What led you to the selection of critical race theory as a research focus? How and why did you become involved with this topic? Well, it, it, I, didn't, I didn't select it. it. It kind of selected me. It was just better than everything else I'd ever come across. Um, the, 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 the key concepts in CRT, the fact that it argues for the voices of people of color, not just to be part of the conversation, but to be actually viewed as being the most knowledgeable people in the room. Um, that just takes a whole set of power relations within the academy uh, and turns them on their head. Um, the idea that um, racism is identified in the very mechanisms that we're told are going to uh, promote equity. So the idea of the meritocracy actually being a, a camouflage um, for the racist status quo. Um, so exposing how can it be that, well, you know, I'm told, well, of course, if everybody has to take the same test, that's fair. We all took the same test. Um, but it's not fair if some people have, have led up to the test with lots of cramming and mentors and they've been told what's on the test and they've prepared their notes and other people have been taken in a room and, and, and blindfold and sat down and, uh, and told to scratch their answers on a, a piece of card. I mean, that's the equivalent of where we are in terms of funding of different parts of the system. Um, and then the idea that, well, you didn't do well in the test. Well, of course I didn't do well in the test. I didn't know it was a test. I wasn't prepared for it. And you've only let me take the first question. In, in a lot of education systems, in England, um, by the time you come to the most important exams, uh, disproportionately black students have, have not even covered most of the curriculum because they've been, from the moment they entered schooling, they've been siphoned into low status um, classes where um, they have less experienced teachers, they, they have um, less good materials, so they cover less of the curriculum. So when they take the test, there's only 20% of the test they even recognize. But the, the system tells you that it's fair and equal and you all had the same chance, and by the way, we're a meritocracy. Mm -hmm. um, so CRT gave just this set of fantastic tools with which to not just make sense of how things are working in the UK. And racism in the UK, in the US, in Canada, in South Africa, there are local twists to it, but by and large, you know, white supremacy is a global uh, phenomenon. Um, and so you, you can recognize those techniques. And, you know, white folks talk to each other. They share these techniques as well. <laughs> So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of interchange. 
Um, and when they find a technique that works well, they, they pass it on. So um, this, this, this is a, 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 a really, I, I think CRT is tremendously powerful. I think it puts powerful tools in people's hands. And I think that's part of the reason why there's such pushback against it, because it started to actually have um, exactly the kind of um, inroads that it, that, that have always been there potentially, and when people start to when people start to use white supremacy, not just to mean the KKK, but to mean the way that white interests and white racism saturates common sense, then you, you're really at a revolutionary moment, and that's when I was going to swear. I won't swear. That that's that's when things get real. We're, we're going to save that. We're going to save the profanity until we get to the bar later, okay? Excellent. Hold that. We're going to be well behaved. Um, what has been, so, so you do watch the, the U.S. news as much as anyone probably in this room. What has been your reactions to the current rhetoric and divisiveness surrounding critical race theory in the United States? Well, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's depressing, it's dehumanizing, it's violent, um, but it's entirely predictable. Um, I mean, it's not an accident that the, the war on CRT, which is what we're in the middle of at the moment, um, was declared after the murder of George Floyd, after Black Lives Matter got reinvigorated globally. And you, I mean, you had mass protests for Black Lives Matter across the world. I mean, um, at least 130 different nations had protests for Black Lives Matter. It wasn't just in the States. Um, and I think that level of mobilization um, scared the crap out of people, the people at the top. And so you had an organized, coordinated, well-funded, deliberate campaign to um, turn CRT into um, the devil incarnate. CRT became the repository for anything and everything that frightens white people, wherever they are on the spectrum, um, whether they're billionaires on Wall Street or um, they're living on the poverty line. Uh, and it was a way to, to put together that that fear and point to CRT and point to people of color and say, they're after what you've got. Um, and the, the, the divisiveness, the, the lunacy of some of the arguments that are put against CRT um, are, are, I mean, they're mirrored globally. So um, the, the level of coordination is, is much easier for me to see from England than it is for you here because this, this is the kind of vortex of all of these forces and the arguments. But four days after Trump issued a directive against CRT and federal training, the English government issued a directive to all state schools from elementary right through um, to secondary, um, reminding them of the need to be um, politically impartial uh, and defining Black Lives Matter as um, an extremist political organization. So a teacher cannot legally use material produced by Black Lives Matter in, in the school, across the country. Um, no matter the context, no matter what the material is, the government has already defined Black Lives Matter as an extremist political ideology. Uh, and this stuff happened absolutely in lockstep as it did over here um, some of the people are the same. Um, and I mean, some of the, the, the coordination. So you have think tanks in this country behind a lot of the stuff, the, the Manhattan Institute, um, the Heritage Foundation. Um, they were producing stuff within two or three months of George Floyd's murder. Uh, they were producing documents that were giving people um, the evidence on why CRT is Marxist, um, uh, pulling on these anti-Semitic tropes about um, critical theory, um, 
basically telling white folks how to organize to silence this. At the back of one of the first, I think it's a Manhattan in Institute book, it basically says, this is how to take over school boards. This is what we need to do. And then alongside that, you had brand new organizations um, popping up, often not telling you where the funding's coming from, with the same people involved on both sides of the Atlantic, um, and they, they do, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, kind of astroturfing. So they pretend to be a grassroots organization, but it's, it's, it's fake grassroots. Um, so it, they're, they're being funded by right-wing foundations. Um, they're getting lots of publicity. They're asked to write articles for big newspapers. They get help on social media. Um, but they're pretending to be the voice of the people who are terrified by this specter of CRT. Um, and that's exactly the same here in the States and in the UK. Um, and they get lots and lots of airtime. You, you uh, mentioned sort of the heightened uh, period where CRT was um, very much so a political instrument. Mm. Uh, not to suggest we're past that. But the next question is, what are some of the most egregious misperceptions you have heard about CRT in education? Um, well, the, the, the most obvious one is that it's racist. So um, uh, 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 an academic, philosophical, practical, political movement absolutely dedicated to opposing racism is accused of being racist. Um, and it's accused of being racist because it dares to mention white people and their involvement in racism. Um, and I think that, you know, all of these, the, these lies are easily called out, but they're tremendously powerful because they're telling the audience what they want to hear. So, um, you know, there was a, a brief period um, after the murder of George Floyd where, where you saw these articles about what, how do white folks educate themselves? Um, and really quickly, white folks were being told, you don't need to educate yourselves because you're not the problem. The problem is the people that are attacking you. And they're attacking you because they hate white people. And they hate merit. And they hate equity. Um, they, just want, they, they just want a free ride. Um, so every single one of the things that are thrown against CRT is the mirror opposite. So the idea that... Uh, in England, there's this constant repetition. Critical race theorists only see two kinds of people, oppressors and victims. So they say that all white people are equally powerful, equally racist, uh, and all people of color are just a, um, a single unit, and they're all entirely powerless. If you actually pick up any piece of decent CRT, you see lots of arguments about how um, whiteness and white racism is used um, to help poor whites get by into the system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, CRT of all approaches has so many different specialist approaches within it. You know, lack crit, tribal crit. Um, so CRT is the last approach that says, oh yeah, yeah, you're either one of them or one of them. CRT is all about the intricacies, um, the detail. I mean, intersectionality. Lot, I, I go to a lot of conferences where people go, oh, well, I'm in, I, I, I do intersectional work, by which they mean um, they do gender or they do class, but, but, but they describe it as intersectional. And, and when you say, well, where's the intersectionality? They'll, 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 they'll point to a sentence at the beginning of the paper that says, well, of course, there are also inequalities around race and class and, and, and sexuality and, oh, disability, but I don't have time for that, I'm just gonna look at this. And that's, that's intersectionality. So the, the idea that you know, critical race theorists think that race is the only game in town is, um, it, it's, it's uh, I'm gonna be really technical. It's bullshit, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but it's what, it's what the audience wants to hear. It's, it's, it, it tells them what they want to hear, that CRT is not complex, it's not thoughtful, um, it's not inclusive, it's not anti-racist. They're told it's the exact opposite of those things. And that serves the interests of 
white power holders very, very well. We didn't make it. Sorry. We were supposed to make it out of this session, but it's okay. I hope everyone's all right. No. I no. apologize. I'm the, from England. We're the president is here if you need to report to anyone. Uh, so one of the reasons um, you, you've certainly been featured this year is to, to show and highlight the global footprint of, of research that's very relevant to ASH. Um, and so I want to broaden your responses by contextualizing where you are from and are situated. You are based, you are based in the UK. You received both your bachelor's degree and PhD from the University of Nottingham. What parallels can you draw between the backlash in the US related to CRT and the current climate in the UK? Mm -hmm. uh, and to take it a step further, if you see it on a global scale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, as, as with all of these things, it's, it's a complex picture, but that doesn't mean that you can't um, define key elements to it. So I've already mentioned about some of the, the, the kind of commonalities. Two of the things that are absolutely the same on both sides of the Atlantic is in the, the current attacks on CRT the gaslighting and the intimidation. So that's exactly the same. So the gaslighting um, from colleagues, um, from politicians, from academics in, in other disciplines who are wheeled out to tell you that these huge race disparities are actually not about race, they're actually about something else. Mm -hmm. And um, they might be about class, or they might be about diet, or they might be about genetics, that's a very popular one. Um, but it's certainly not about racism, and to imagine that it's about racism is just to be crude and divisive. And a lot of money is put into this through the think tanks that I've mentioned, but also um, through official attempts to shut you down. So um, you had the 1776 Commission here. In England, we had a thing called the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities which was um, a collection of people, uh, largely right-wing um, uh, commentators, who were told to go away and look at all of the ethnic disparities in education, policing, health, and, and do a state-of-the-art um, report on what lies behind it. And just like the 1776 Commission, they came back with what the government wanted to hear, which was, it's not about racism, it's by and large the fault of the people that are experiencing the inequality, deficit images around culture, family breakdown, uh, lack of aspiration, just appalling stuff. And really Mickey Mouse stuff. I mean, not even well done. You know, the 1776 Commission report is just a joke. And exactly the same with the, the, the Commission in England. So you not only had critical scholars saying this is ridiculous, it's not worth the paper it's printed on. You had mainstream academic bodies. The British uh, Medical Journal published an analysis of its, its, its work on um, uh, COVID-19 and the ethnic disproportionalities. I said, there's, there's no evidence for any of the things that are being said here. It's just a tissue of lies. Um, but it was all that the powers that be needed. They just want, it, it may be tissue thin and it may be laughably um, pathetic when you look at it and try and find the evidence behind it and the evidence doesn't exist, but it's all that the government wanted. So all the UK government wanted was to be able to hold something up and say, look, we've got a state-of-the-art report and it says it's not about racism, it's your fault, not mine. And that is now the engine for shutting down discussions around racism. Um, it's somewhat different here, as I was saying to someone earlier. In the UK, there's not really a public language for talking about race. You'll remember when you were there. In, in the UK, people talk about class. They assume that social class is everything. Uh, and when you talk about race, a lot of people respond like, you're, you're being a bit crude and, and a bit rude. We don't really talk about race. We don't have a language for it. Whereas here, there's a public language for race, uh, and less so one around social class. 
one of the beauties of CRT is that it, it points out that, well, there isn't a right and a wrong. Whatever language you use will be subverted to defend the racism. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of the, uh, the, the, the classic ways in which this works in England, which is remarkable when you tell people outside of the UK, but, but a lot of people in Britain imagine that, that, that Britain wasn't really that involved in the slave trade. <laughs> so when, when, when Black Lives Matter kicked off, in, in England, the first response, and this has also been an academic response to CRT is, well, that might, it might be like that in America, but it's, it doesn't work in England. Racism's not that bad in England. Now, actually, the overrepresentation of black young men in prison in the UK is worse than the overrepresentation of African American men in prisons in the US. But folks in the UK can't even imagine that. They, 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 they don't imagine that that's a thing because racism happens over there. So they imagine that the slave trade might be a defining issue for, for the states, but, but really didn't, it, it's like, you know, England wasn't really that involved. We, we might have provided a few ships. Um, whereas actually, and you know, David Olasogo is a, a, the leading historian of this stuff, um, a, a black British historian in the UK who keeps pointing out, well, you, you know, British historians bang on about the Industrial Revolution, we led the world. The Industrial Re Revolution was, was born out of slavery. It was built on genocide. Um, there is, that's simply not taught, it's not mentioned. And yet, um, the UK government was still paying off compensation to slave owners, not, not to descendants of slaves, but to the descendants of slave owners, they were paying off compensation until 2015. So mm. every taxpayer virtually in the UK has donated to paying off the people that were compensated for losing their slaves. And yet we're told that slavery isn't a big deal, deal in understanding British history. So there are both these commonalities that, that certain elements are identical in the UK uh, and in the US, but there are also these weird um, particular um, uh, national elements. So, so in, 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 in America, the, the, the arguments around freedom of speech um, and how that gets perverted are very much now being transposed into the UK. They're trying to whip up a freedom of speech crisis where none exists. And, and as in the States, one of the key things that they always talk about is, well, we must be able to talk about research on genetics and how black people are genetically predisposed to be criminals and less intelligent. And the whole trans debate has now become front and center of that. And on, again, on both sides of the Atlantic, so the, um, just simply the policy around bathrooms for this conference would have made headline news in the UK because that is, is, is promoted in the UK as an assault on women, as an assault on, um, on everything that we've ever known about um, fact and fiction. So um, in, in, in some ways, the, the, the powers that be on either side of the Atlantic are constantly picking up ideas from each other and transposing those arguments. In case you missed it, a tissue of lies. <laughs> Gearborn 2022, <laughs> okay? A tissue of lies. So in 2018, you co-wrote a paper on quant crit using CRT with statistics. It's had a lot of reactions, both good and bad, Share that with our audience. Right. Well, there, there are people in here. There's, there's at least three, um, three papers um, on the, the, the program around quant crit. Um, and I'm only one of lots of people um, uh, working on this. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not my baby. But it, and, and it really was generated um, around um, meetings at... Um, the Critical Race Studies in Education Association, uh, where folks realized we were all working away on how could we use statistics in the service of race equality? Because statistics are so often used to shut down arguments about anti-racism. Um, and um, 
people were pulling together these ideas and, and quant crit came out of that. The, the argument um, that, that myself and colleagues made was to, and we actually copied, and we say this, we're, 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 we're very open about um, stealing ideas, um, or being inspired, sorry. Um, the, the, the work around disability critical race theory, discrit, um, I, I think is phenomenally important. And what those scholars did was to say, right, well, let's take the, the, the key tenets of CRT and transpose them into disability and say, what questions does that force us to ask that we're not asking? So we did that with um, work around statistics, quantitative research. So the, one of the key things around CRT is that racism is central. Well, statistics are really bad at getting at racism. Um, and often they're used to shut down discussions about racism because actually the, the language that, that most of us are, are kind of led to believe about statistics is that they're cold, hard facts. Statistics are neutral. Um, they're balanced, whereas we're emotional and we're qualitative and, and you know, um, uh, we're told that our data is anecdotal, but numbers are hard facts. Whereas, in fact, all numbers are made up as well. All numbers are socially constructed. Statistics aren't sitting around in nice, neat packages for people to come and, and, and count. Somebody makes a decision about what do we count and what don't we count. Um, how do we put people in different boxes? Uh, and what do we do with them? I mean, one of the arguments we made in the first paper was that actually the more you manipulate the numbers, the more you introduce white racist bias. Because those models haven't been developed um, with an understanding of how racism works. So in the UK, a classic example, um, as in the States, certain minoritized groups are much more likely to be expelled from school. And when you're expelled in England, you really get back into full-time education. You're much more likely to wind up involved um, in the criminal justice system. You're much, much less likely to have a job. So it matters that black kids are three times more likely to be excluded, expelled, than white kids. So what the government did was to run some statistics um, when they came out by saying, actually, black kids aren't that overrepresented. When you control for their income, what school they go to, how old they are, how long their teacher's been in the classroom, about 70 different things, most of which had nothing to do with how racism operates, and some of which are how racism operates. So income is racially patterned. So if you take out a relationship with income, you're, not, you're, you're taking out part of the way in which the racism works. But what a lot of statisticians do is to run models and then go, right, if there's any inequality left at the end, that'll be the racism. <laughs> Whereas actually the racism is operating through uh, streaming, setting, tracking. It's hugely racialized. But, but a lot of statisticians will do an analysis of tracking as if it's got nothing to do with race. So their models remove racism from the picture. Mm. So Quantcrit is about trying to debunk how statisticians operate to normalize racism and then turn it on its head and say, well, actually, if we come to statistics with an understanding of racism, how can we use statistics to document the racism? Because we're told that statistics are so powerful. Why don't we use them to our ends? Um, and there was an enormous pushback on that. I, I think one of the ways you, you know you're doing something good is when you, you really annoy people. Um, and Quantcrit was immediately picked up by Campus Reform. We, uh, we, we were featured in lots of different stuff online about how we were destroying the academy. Um, uh, I, I was featured in a, a Nazi website in Europe, um, and it's a proper Nazi website. It's none of your neo-Nazi. Down, down the side, uh, where, the sidebar where they have, you know, other things online on this site, they, they translated um, into um, Norwegian um, an SS handbook. So this is a full-on Nazi website. And they've got an article about quantitative critical race theory, which to me says they're really terrified. 
that, that we're going to get hold of what have been their tools, statistics, and we're going to use them to our ends. So I, I think the amount of pushback on Quantcrit is, is really important because I think it tells us, you know, there's a lot of things that, that we can do with this um, to really push the arguments forward. So keep this energy here. When we last spoke, you mentioned that you have been paying close attention to the political action of white strategists using black faces to give voice to white racism mm. in both the US and UK. Would you mind sharing what you learned with our audience? Yeah, well, this is where, where the UK's played catch up because I, I know in, in the States, this, this, is, this has been a, a part of, of the political reality for a long time. Um, so again, um, Derek Bell, as, as a really one of the founders of CRT, laid out the, um, the instruction manual on how this operates in a, a, a piece. It's the fir first piece that I, I use with students when I'm, I'm teaching critical race theory, called the rules of racial standing. Uh, and, and Bell basically argues that we're all judged on two things. The first thing is how we're racialized. So are we seen as someone who's likely to be defending racism or, or benef benefiting from racism or opposing it? And then our actions, are we with racism or against it? And Bell you know, takes it apart in, in, in minute detail. One of the interesting things um, is that he argues that actually members of the oppressor group are taken in legal cases to be a better witness to oppression than the oppressed. And as a white anti-racist, so I try and use my whiteness against whiteness. So I work with NGOs, community groups, unions, um, and I am often specifically brought in to be the, the white professor who tells the government that their statistics aren't worth the paper they're written on. And the white guy doing that is, is using the whiteness back against itself. Um, because um, if you were to do that, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? Whereas the white guy saying these numbers aren't worth the paper they're written on, I'm actually pulling on all of that unspoken authority of whiteness to debunk one of the key tools of whiteness. So that's, that's trying to use it back against itself. But the, the phenomenon that you're talking about, people of color becoming the spokespeople for white racism, um, has really taken off in the last 10 years in the UK. Um, there was a point, a few, we, we keep having crises in, amongst our leaders in, in the UK, but there was a point three or four weeks ago where apart from the Prime Minister, every one of the major state officers in England was held by a person of colour. And not one of them has done anything about racism ever in their political careers except to try and shut down any discussion of it. So there's this superficial, oh look, we've got a, a diverse looking cabinet, but it's one of the most racist in history. It's also one of the most wealthy in history. Um, but the, the, the kind of Mickey Mouse level of discussion around race in a lot of the media is that, well, um, this person, so, you know, um, Dinesh D'Souza is a classic example in the States. Dinesh D'Souza is from a minoritized group he must know what he's talking about, as long as what he's talking about is that there's no racism. Whereas yourself talking about racism, you're special pleading, you're looking for breaks, you would say that. Same thing in the UK. So um, thousands of minoritized, well, hundreds of minoritized academics talking about how racism saturates the system are discounted. One black academic saying it's not about racism, it's about the black family, it's about black masculinity, um, is super promoted, told he's being courageous, and is now literally in the House of Lords. In the UK, we have this bizarre system where people are appointed to our upper house as a political appointment. And so the guy that's made his career by being the black academic who says racism doesn't exist anymore is now uh, a member of the House of Lords. Everyone join me in thanking Professor Gilborn for coming and sharing in a very transparent way uh, with us.
Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage ASH 2022 Program Committee Co-Chair, Dr. Bridget Turner Kelly. Good morning, good morning. It's wonderful to, to see you all in the cruel and unusual punishment of getting up, um, <laughs> getting up early and, and being inside. Um, and not getting to enjoy this wonderful, wonderful weather and day today. Um, what a remarkable um, gift we all just got to, to listen to and just to, to carry over a through line from when you all were here yesterday from our presidential speech to have the unearthing of lies um, and the truth being told um, is such a powerful thing and that we rarely get um, as we often in, in the US as well are often um, not supposed to talk about these things, particularly in, in mixed company. Um, and so we really appreciate you doing, you doing just that and being very subversive and, and ignoring whiteness and swearing because that is a part of whiteness, right? To be um, dignified and to, to use a certain language. So we appreciate you breaking out of that even in your, in your conversation today. So just my job is just to um, quickly give you both um, a token of appreciation from Ash and um, Thank you for, for your time today. And we are off to our next session, yes, ahead of time. So enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs> 